The Rattler, with a mean 166 foot drop at 73 miles an hour, it bites you. After all, it didn't get its name for nothing. They like to do things bigger and better. Well, here's an example of that. The motto is called the Rattler, a wooden roller coaster built as the fastest, tallest, and the steepest, so sit back and take a ride. This is the Rattler, a monstrously large wooden roller coaster famous for its steep cliff diving drops. The ride opened in 1992 at the brand new Fiesta Texas Amusement Park as the world's tallest, fastest, and steepest wooden roller coaster. The Rattler was built during the Roller Coaster Wars, where amusement parks continuously battled to introduce the latest record-breaking roller coaster. However, the attraction would go down in history as one of the most problematic wooden roller coasters ever built. It would cause injury after injury, and have major changes made to it what seemed like every year, as the park attempted to fix its long list of various design and build issues. In fact, the ride is no longer even a wooden roller coaster and goes by the name Iron Rattler. The original Rattler was built by the Roller Coaster Corporation of America, the same company responsible for Son of Beast at Kings Island, another disastrous wooden roller coaster I covered in a prior episode of Problematic Roller Coasters. If you've seen my video on Son of Beast, you probably have an idea of where we're going with this one. Luckily, Rattler was able to survive longer than Son of Beast did, but only due to a series of major renovations and improvements, as it opened with a long list of issues that Fiesta Texas would spend well over a decade fixing. Before we get started, if you guys wouldn't mind hitting the like button, that would be greatly appreciated, as that helps the channel immensely against the YouTube algorithm. Alright, let's dig in. Before there was Fiesta Texas, which now goes by the name Six Flags Fiesta Texas, there was the Redland Quarry. The Redland Quarry operated on the same plot of land that Six Flags Fiesta Texas occupies today, and led to the formation of the massive cliff walls Fiesta Texas is famous for. Redland Quarry first began its operations in 1934, and mined limestone which the San Antonio area is rich with. The Redland Quarry would blast away and excavate crushed stone, sand, and gravel for decades as work crews worked through the hillside and cleared it of its limestone deposits. In 1988, the area was officially exhausted of its limestone, and the owners of the quarry looked to sell the property for some form of future development. In 1989, USAA, a real estate company, and Gaylord Entertainment Corporation, which owned the Opryland USA theme park in Nashville, Tennessee, became interested in the property and worked together to develop it into a brand new theme park. Interestingly, San Antonio had seen the addition of its first major theme park, SeaWorld San Antonio, only one year prior in 1988. Throughout Texas was also Six Flags Over Texas in Arlington and Six Flags Astro World in Houston. Even with the already established competition, the development team were still confident that the San Antonio area provided enough of a vacation destination to allow the park to flourish. In the spring of 1990, construction of the new Fiesta Texas theme park officially broke ground. A sign was placed on the 200-acre property advertising a grand opening in the spring of 1992. The sign further advertised Fiesta Texas as a musical show park as the original intent was to make Fiesta Texas a destination performing arts park, with a focus on the musical culture of Texas. The park would open with four different theme sections, Crack Axle Canyon, Los Festivales, Spassburg, and Rockville. Crack Axle Canyon brings us to the topic of this video, as it would be home to the park's marquee attraction, the Rattler. Despite the park's musical focus, Gaylord Entertainment Corporation and USAA wished to open the park with a brand new record-breaking wooden roller coaster to attract thrill seekers. For the ride's opening season in 1992, it had to be the world's tallest, fastest, steepest, most unique, and greatest wooden roller coaster, and at the same time, also be a smooth and acceptable ride for families to enjoy. It was even decided to incorporate the quarry walls along the perimeter of the park into the coaster's layout. The park contracted the Roller Coaster Corporation of America, or RCCA, to design and construct their record-breaking roller coaster. As I mentioned earlier regarding Son of Beast, RCCA were a shady roller coaster manufacturer, and Fiesta Texas would soon fall into their trap. Unfortunately for Fiesta Texas, the Rattler would be the first coaster the company would produce completely on their own, as there weren't any existing roller coasters both designed and built by RCCA to scare Fiesta Texas toward another manufacturer. RCCA had previously constructed but not designed rides like Great American Scream Machine at Six Flags Over Georgia and Judge Roy Scream at Six Flags Over Texas. They also most likely offered Fiesta Texas a very cheap price to build such a massive coaster. RCCA would work under a subsidiary company RCCT, or the Roller Coaster Corporation of Texas, while they performed work on the Rattler, just like when they worked as the Roller Coaster Corporation of Ohio when they installed Son of Beast at Kings.
Kings Island. In 1990, the world's fastest wooden roller coaster was American Eagle at Six Flags Great America, which had opened in 1981. American Eagle reached speeds of 66 miles per hour, or 106 kilometers per hour, at the bottom of its first drop. However, the largest drop on a wooden roller coaster was found on Hercules at Dorney Park. Hercules only stood at 95 feet, or 29 meters tall, but featured a massive 151 foot, or 46 meter drop, by using the park's terrain. But even with this large of a drop, Hercules only reached speeds of 65 miles per hour, or 104 kilometers per hour, not enough to dethrone American Eagle. On the other hand, Six Flags Over Texas featured Texas Giant, the world's tallest wooden roller coaster, which stood at a height of 143 feet, or 43 meters. Looking at all these records, there wasn't a single wooden coaster that collectively held the height, speed, and largest drop record. They were all dispersed amongst different roller coasters. Fiesta Texas wanted the Rattler to be both the tallest and fastest, so the ride was designed to do so. But this original design would never see the light of day, as several changes would be made to Rattler's lift hill and first drop, and consequently, other parts of the layout later in 1990. The park also required that the station be elevated high above the ground so that the park's railroad could pass underneath. This would present another design hurdle. Yet another design change occurred during the summer of 1991, after Cedar Point opened Mean Streak which broke all the wooden coaster records of 1990. In a panic, Fiesta Texas went to RCCA to ask what could be done to make Rattler taller, in which RCCA complied and made happen in August of 1991. I'll give much more detail about these design changes later in the video. Even crazier, at this point, construction of the Rattler was already well underway, as work had begun over a year prior during the spring of 1990. Much of the ride had already been constructed, so RCCA sort of forced additional height and speed into the attraction on top of the other changes already made. These design changes would cause delays in the construction site, as work crews paused building while design changes took place, and then continued once the final design was ready. There was also a wet winter, which further delayed construction. Park officials wanted the coaster ready by Fiesta Texas' opening day, which was scheduled for May of 1992. To combat, RCCA would take a major risk and shorten the originally planned two-month window for testing and modifications. At the time, modifications were almost always required on new roller coasters, especially ones as large as the Rattler. This decision would lead to major headaches down the road. They asked me to tell y'all about a little project we just wrapped up here in San Antonio. They call it Fiesta, Texas. Nothing fancy, just the darkest theme park built in America in the last 20 years. And you can ride the Rattler. World's tallest wooden roller coaster. On March 14th, 1992, Fiesta, Texas would open its gates to the general public, and guests were able to climb aboard the Rattler, which had successfully opened as the world's tallest, fastest, and steepest wooden roller coaster. The ride absolutely dominated the skyline of Fiesta, Texas, standing at a height of 179 feet, or 55 meters. The ride's tallest point from ground level was 176 feet, or 54 meters above the bottom of the ravine. The ride also featured a 166 foot, or 51 meter drop, sloped at 61.4 degrees, and reached speeds up to 73 miles per hour, or 117 kilometers per hour. The park also claimed that the ride pulled up to 3 Gs. The gigantic wooden structure rose high above the quarry walls, using them to its advantage as it climbed above and dropped from them several times throughout the layout. The ride started with a left-hand drop into the main lift hill, where trains were pulled to the top at a rate of 9 feet per second. Trains reached the top of the lift hill, where they entered a small 7-foot pre-drop and zigzagged to the left a zigzag which shifted the entire structure off the top of the cliff. The train then descended down the massive drop as it turned to the right, followed by a tight pullout where the train banked and turned to the left as it rode through a roof that protected riders from falling rocks. The coaster then rose into a gigantic second hill, in which the train hardly had enough speed to complete, and then dropped into a high-speed fan curve, which was highly banked and featured two drops, with the second drop diving back down the cliff wall to ground level. The train would then ascend the cliff wall through a straightaway. The ride entered a wide 900 degree helix. The train curved in the clockwise direction as it rode up and down through a series of bunny hills within the helix. Finally, the train would exit the helix and climb an awkward looking zigzag before dropping from the cliff into a small tunnel that traveled through the quarry wall. The train exited the tunnel through a right hand turn as it climbed up a hill before descending back down to the left and right past the station. The ride climbed up another small hill, where it banked to the left and into a funky left-hand descending curve. After passing underneath the lift hill, the train would rise into the final brake run, ending the ride. On top of being the world's tallest, fastest, and steepest wooden roller coaster, Rattler was also quite long, and rocked an impressive 5,080 feet, or 1,548 meters of track. 
On top of that, the ride took on average over 95 seconds from when it dropped off the lift hill to when it hit the final brake run. The ride attracted lines as long as 3 hours when it opened, as thousands of thrill seekers waited their turn to give it a spin. One of the Rattler's most iconic features was its first drop, which was substantially steeper and more thrilling than the competition. David Lipnicki, Public Relations Director for the American Coaster Enthusiast, or ACE, has described the original first drop as the single best element he has ever experienced on a roller coaster. Just watching from videos, the way the drop curves and then continues getting steeper and steeper before slamming into a tight pullout looks insane. I would have loved to try it out for myself. But not all parkgoers found the drop to be enjoyable. In fact, even several ACE members found it to be too severe and intense. This is what the ride's designer, John Pierce, had to say about the ride. One of the foremen working on the ride asked me, how did I come up with the idea? And I said, I had a fight with my wife that night. And he came back by a couple of minutes later and said, Mr. Pierce, that must have been one hell of a fight. Even worse, many guests suffered minor injuries or whiplash specifically from the first drop. The bottom of the drop did not pull 3 Gs like the park advertised, but instead 5 Gs. Very forceful for a roller coaster, especially a wooden one. Many blame the attraction for a variety of neck, back, and shoulder injuries. According to this letter from John A. Hoover, an operations manager at Fiesta Texas written to Michael Black, the president of RCCA, Rattler caused over 260 injuries to guests between July and October of 1992. Of these injuries, over 51% of them occurred because of the first drop. 8% occurred during the fan curve, 2% occurred inside the ride's tunnel, and 1-2% occurred in the large 900 degree helix. 28% of riders injured were unable to recall where on the ride they were hurt, but it's assumed their injuries occurred during the first drop or the fan curve. And 7% of injuries occurred while not on the ride, but while in the queue line or station area. Of the injuries that occurred on the first drop, 36% were head injuries, 31% were neck injuries, 21% were back injuries, 7% were both neck and back injuries, and 7% were some sort of other injury. It was believed that most injuries from the first drop were caused by the sharp pullout and curve as trains maneuver from the first drop into the second hill. This awkwardly exerted a high number of forces on riders in both the vertical and lateral direction. Just look how much tighter the pullout of Rattler was compared to other wooden giants of the day, like Texas Giant at Six Flags Over Texas and Mean Streak at Cedar Point. The fan curve also caused a great deal of neck, back, and head injuries. Injuries could be caused due to the lateral movement, hitting their heads on the back of the seat, and even two riders striking heads with each other. It was also concluded that 77% of injuries occurred while sitting in an even number row of the train. In these rows, riders sat directly above an axle of the car where the wheels rode the track, which usually means a rougher ride on a wooden roller coaster. From what I understand, a lawyer rented a billboard nearby the park advertising that he could help you if you were injured on the rattler. I believe that lawyer was a man by the name of Carl Haggard. Mark Fritz published an article covering roller coaster safety on September 1st of 1996. This is what the article had to say about Rattler. In 1992, the Rattler roller coaster at Fiesta, Texas, a park outside San Antonio, laid claim to the title. It has triggered nearly 30 injury claims. They went all the way from, hey, my neck was sore for a week or two, to I had to have neck surgery, says lawyer Carl Haggard, who had 25 clients. He said the coaster was under quote-unquote horrendous pressure to open on time, yet it passed all sorts of inspections. I'm sure it met industry standards. Well, six years later in 1998, Fiesta Texas paid settlements worth 3.54 million US dollars in lawsuits to 27 different plaintiffs. From what I understand, the Roller Coaster Corporation of Texas, who was responsible for designing and constructing the ride, were also involved in the lawsuits. RCCT would go bankrupt as a result. But because the company was a subsidiary to the True Roller Coaster Corporation of America, RCCA would continue to deliver more wooden monstrosities to other amusement parks. Well, it's safe to say that the last second design changes made to the Rattler were the cause for most injuries. Here's the first drop that the Rattler opened with, and the very original design is most likely what you see here in the green curve. This green curve is shorter in height and doesn't have a pre-drop into a zigzag. Instead, the drop is straighter and begins right off the chain lift. This puts the ride's tallest section on top of the cliff wall, rather than at the bottom of the ravine to the side of the cliff wall. Notice how much wider the pullout is also. With a decreased height, the train would have taken this wider transition at a slower speed, leading to less g-forces. So with this design, the ride most likely did pull 3 Gs as intended. The first design change to Rattler's drop and lift hill would be submitted on November 8th of 1990, after Dorney Park got into a legal dispute with Six Flags Over Texas regarding who had the world's largest wooden roller coaster. So who really has the world's tallest wooden roller coaster? It's a touchy issue. 
so touchy that two parks have been engaged in a legal battle over the title. Six Flags Over Texas in Arlington, Texas, has a roller coaster that climbs the highest, 143 feet. But its drop is only 137 feet long. At Dorney Park in Allentown, Pennsylvania, the roller coaster only climbs to 95 feet, but it has a longer drop, 157 feet. So take your choice. This persuaded officials at Fiesta Texas to modify Rattler's design so that the ride's tallest section was not on top of the cliff wall, but instead over the bottom of the ravine, so that its true height couldn't be questioned. Rattler's designer, John Pierce, made this happen by lengthening the top of Rattler's highest point, which extended the ride's highest section off the cliff wall. I imagine the new design looked like this, with the pre-drop and zigzag into a now curved first drop, similar to what the ride opened with, just smaller. By doing so, the ride now had a support structure that ran from the bottom of the ravine to the top of the drop, which addressed the park's fear. This most likely shrunk the size of the original pullout, but not nearly as tight as what the ride would open with. Another problem would arise when Cedar Point announced and then opened Mean Streak in May of 1991, which stood at a height of 161 feet tall, taller than the planned height of Rattler. Yet again, Fiesta Texas executives went to RCCA to see what could be done, and RCCA answered back in August of 1991. The lift hill was raised to 179 feet, and the first drop was made even steeper so that it fit the same space. Consequently, the ride was also lengthened, and I believe certain hills around the layout were raised in height, and some were pushed further out from the cliff walls like the Helix. A ride the size of Rattler needed a much larger pullout, or at least a pullout that wasn't awkwardly banked to the left. This would have applied g-forces more naturally, instead of on a sideways angle. But somewhat criminally, the ride's true g-forces were not advertised to the public. While 5G's is still an acceptable amount of forces, guests should have been properly warned. And I think part of the reason was due to the trains that rolled the track. Rattler opened with two seven-car trains built by DH Morgan Manufacturing. Each train held a total of 28 riders and were known as some of the lightest wooden coaster trains in the industry. These trains were completed in August of 1991 and based on the original design specifications of the attraction, where the ride pulled a maximum of 3 Gs, meaning they were designed and built to handle up to 3 Gs of forces. They were then shipped and delivered to the park in September of 1991 so that they would be ready for the originally planned two months of testing. Well, it seems that Morgan Manufacturing were aware of the lift height changes made to Rattler, but not that the ride would exert more forces. Dana Morgan, president of Morgan Manufacturing, wrote a letter to Michael Black on March 25th of 1992, voicing his concerns regarding the design changes made to the attraction, the rushed opening of the ride, and that his trains weren't built to handle the forces Rattler delivered. Even so, Rattler would continue to operate with these same trains even while the ride exerted more forces than the trains were designed to handle. This is yet another criminal-like move involved with the design, build, and operation of Rattler. In 1993, headrests were added to the Morgan trains, most likely to offer additional head support to help avoid the injuries the ride was causing. However, I'm not sure if these offered any improvement to the ride experience. In 1995, the original Morgan trains were replaced by trains built by Philadelphia Toboggan Coasters, or PTC. Instead of each train being 7 cars long, each train was shortened to 5 cars as the PTC cars were heavier than the Morgan cars, and the structure was only designed to handle so much weight. Another major issue with the Rattler was the rate at which trains traveled the track. With the ride's gigantic first drop, subsequent large hills, and long length, the Rattler was naturally very sensitive when it came to speed. Trains could easily travel the course too slowly, or also too quickly. The sensitivity was highly dependent on the weather. Early in the ride's career, there were days the park would keep the ride closed because it was running too fast, which risked subjecting riders to unsafe g-forces. The ride was ideally supposed to take 95 to 100 seconds from when it dropped off the lift hill to when it hit the final brake run. But trains could travel as fast as 84 to 88 seconds or as slow as over 110 seconds. It's my understanding that sandbags had to be loaded into all morning test runs of Rattler to give trains enough momentum to complete the circuit, or else they risk stalling at the top of a hill or even valleying. In the same letter sent from Dana Morgan to Michael Black, Morgan voiced his concerns about Rattler's speed sensitivity. He wrote that 5Gs were recorded from a 98 second runtime. If the coaster were to run below 90 seconds, the g-forces would be well beyond safe limits. He also wrote that well-designed coasters up to 3,000 feet in length can normally withstand the changes in velocity without going outside of safe limits. However, the changes are great enough on longer rides such as the Rattler that it is virtually impossible to design an exciting coaster that will make it over every hill under cold high friction conditions, 
and not be too fast under low friction conditions. Rides over 3,000 feet should, in my opinion, be designed with either booster wheels or speed moderating slowdown brakes, or both, in order to be able to control them within safe limits. Looking at other giant wooden roller coasters of the time, Texas Giant and Mean Streak both featured a mid-course brake run, while Rattler did not. On Texas Giant and Mean Streak, this brake run is primarily to aid the efficient operation of three trains, but they could also act as a speed monitor. If the rides ran too fast, these brakes could slow down trains slightly so that they completed the rest of the course within a safe limit. With speed moderating slowdown brakes or trim brakes designed into a ride, coasters can be designed in a way so that they still complete the circuit in cold weather, and then in hotter weather when the trains will run faster, the trims can slow down trains to within safe operational limits. Michael Black would then reach out to Fiesta Texas following discussion with Dana Morgan and John Pierce, where he informed the park that RCCA would be moving two brakes from the station area to this area of the ride here following the helix, which is before the large drop into the tunnel. Supposedly, the ride also faced structural issues on the turn out of the tunnel as it would sway far too much. The addition of trims would help to ease the sway. In 1993, the rattler would begin to see the first of many revisions to the ride's profiling. The small pre-drop and S-bend that led into the first drop was straightened and sloped downward to help bring a more direct entrance into the first drop. Thus, the first drop technically began right off the lift hill. This most likely shrunk the ride's original height of 176 feet from the bottom of the ravine. In 1994, the first drop would be reprofiled further. The bottom of the drop was raised 42 feet, resulting in a drop shrinking from 166 feet to 124 feet. This eliminated the tight 5G pullout and substantially reduced the G-forces exerted, but also reduced the ride's top speed to 65 miles per hour. Being smaller in size and more spread out, this version was far less steep and probably much more comfortable for riders. Dana Morgan originally recommended recontouring the first pullout in 1992 so that forces were minimized to 3Gs under normal running conditions. The height of the ride's second hill was also lowered by 19 feet. This helped trains travel over the hill faster and reduced the chance of stalling at the top. Riders in the front rows even got a little airtime as trains cruised over the hill. In 1997, the first drop would be modified again. The drop was straightened further and the zigzagging was reduced. The profiling of the 1994 drop followed the right side of the structure here. You can see how it curved further out as the 1994 version followed the original profiling of the structure, which zigzagged heavily. So for this newer version of the drop, the structure was cantilevered in the other direction to support the new track profile. Thus, the first drop now hung over the side of the original structure. This is what helped make the drop more straight. These angled supports marked here are what stretch from the original structure to the new wider ledgers that support the new track profiling. In 1996, Time Warner took over management and operations of Fiesta Texas and rebranded the park as none other than Six Flags Fiesta Texas, which the park still goes by to to this day. Six Flags also added a new control system to the ride and along with that an additional block zone. In the process, Rattler was upgraded to handle three train operations. Dana Morgan originally recommended doing so in 1992 to allow for three train operations. For those of you who are unfamiliar, a block zone is a section of ride that only one train may occupy. At the end of a block zone is a method to stop a train in case the block zone ahead is still occupied. This is the safety system that prevents roller coaster trains from colliding into one another. Here we have the block zone diagram of the original Rattler when it opened. First we have the station, then the lift hill, followed by main break 1 at the end of the ride, and main break 2 directly before the station. So a total of 4 block zones. Now it's also a possibility that main break 1 was only programmed to act as a trim and wasn't technically a block zone meaning the ride only had three block zones, but we'll assume it was a block. In 1996, the location after the helix where trims were previously placed was reprofiled so that the entire section was now flat. The brake area was then upgraded and reprogrammed to act as a block zone. So the new block zones became the station, lift hill, mid-course block zone, main break one, and main break two, for a total of five block zones. In this setup, main break one was absolutely programmed to act as its own block zone. The Rattler was thus capable of operating with three five-car trains. However, as Six Flags began cutting budget and staffed the ride with less and less operators, the crew began to stack all trains at the end of the ride. The maintenance department were also looking to cut costs and wanted to permanently reduce the ride to two train operations, so that only two trains would need to be maintained. They also argued that the ride wasn't popular enough for three train operations and used the slow operations to their advantage. Thus, the ride would stop three train operations and only run two. 
Rattler would continue to see modifications to its track profiling that would further differentiate it from when it opened. In 1995, the bottom of the ride's second drop was raised higher from the ravine, which made the second drop much less steep and intense. It was probably a much smoother experience for riders. At the same time, I believe the climb into the helix above the cliff wall was also shortened in height, allowing trains to cruise over this hill more quickly, helping to limit the chance of stalling. However, trim brakes would follow immediately after to slow trains into the helix. In 1996, the drop into the tunnel was tweaked so that the banking into the tunnel was more comfortable. In 1999, the final curve before the final brake run was modified. The original zigzagging of the curve was removed and replaced with a smooth and continuous curving drop. The ride's second drop would see further changes early in the 2000s. The middle of the curve was raised substantially so that the drop was now one long single drop instead of a curving double down. This would help to eliminate the rough transition between the two drops and smoothen the experience. The 900 degree helix would also see more modifications. The original hills contained inside the helix were tamed and made much smaller. In the ride's later years, essentially all the hills of the first lap of the helix were eliminated and the first lap was almost completely flat. The remainder of the helix remained largely the same however as when the ride first opened. Now with all the changes made to Rattler's track profiling and support structure over the years, as well as the addition of heavier trains from PTC, the ride became known for its ridiculous sway in sections of the structure. The most noticeable sway was visible during the ride's second drop, where it's obvious that the structure shifts what seems like several feet, especially at the end of the second drop as the train begins to climb into the first helix. There was also a noticeable amount of sway on the ride's final helix as the train flew by the exit ramp and station. The structure would sway to the right and actually hit the exit ramp itself. You can even see how the fencing of the exit ramp was extended vertically to guard against the moving structure. Apparently, the sway of this turn has been an issue since the ride opened, but I don't believe the ride's second drop used to sway this much, as the original was much lower to the ground. With the bottom of the second drop now much higher off the ground, the new structure is now able to sway out much further than the lower and more rigid structure would have been able to in the past. Combine that with heavier wooden coaster trains and you get this. In March of 2011, Rattler would open for the season with yet another modification to the second drop. The second drop was known for being excessively rough and causing massive jackhammering for riders. While well, Six Flags contracted Rocky Mountain Construction, or RMC, to add steel topper track to the bottom of the second drop on Rattler. This replaced the top two layers of wooden track with one large piece of steel, which dramatically smoothened this part of the ride. Riders can now enjoy the ride's second large drop without being subjected to pain and discomfort caused by excessive jackhammering. The rest of the ride, however, remained fully wooden. During the summer of 2012, Six Flags Fiesta Texas announced that they would be closing Rattler forever and that the ride's last day of operation would be August 5th of that year. Rumors began circulating as Six Flags had previously closed Texas Giant at Six Flags Over Texas in 2009 and RMC converted the ride into a steel hybrid coaster with their state-of-the-art steel iBox track. Texas Giant thus became New Texas Giant, a brand new roller coaster that offered a much smoother, more intense, and thrilling experience than the original Texas Giant. While well, Fiesta Texas followed suit and announced in August of 2012 that they would be transforming Rattler into this. Iron Rattler would open in the spring of 2013 and be a complete reimagining of the original Rattler, with steel iBox track and a brand new ride experience. Designed by Alan Schilke, the new attraction would stand at the same height as the original, but bring back the ride's massive first drop and an even more intense, yet also comfortable form factor. The new first drop would be 171 feet, 5 feet larger than the original drop, and reach an angle of descent of 81 degrees, 20 degrees steeper than the original. Now the ride's new layout would be much shorter at just 3,266 feet, but still a massive improvement as it now featured ejector airtime hills, overbank turns, and eliminated the slow and meandering 900 degree helix atop the cliff wall. Construction crews got to work and removed the ride's original wooden track, reworked the structure to match the ride's new profiling, and added red steel eye box track to the attraction. Six Flags Fiesta Texas would deliver as promised, and on May 25th of 2013, Iron Rattler would officially open to the public. The ride instantly became a massive hit, and in my opinion, it is the best roller coaster in the state of Texas. It offers an intense first drop that blew me away, great pops of ejector airtime, overbank turns that hug the cliff walls, a zero-g barrel roll with ejector airtime for riders in the back rows, and the legendary ejector airtime hill off the cliff wall. 
and it executes all this insanity while being a very smooth, comfortable, and enjoyable roller coaster. Iron Rattler essentially eliminated all the problems of the original Rattler and still thrills riders in the same way as when it opened. No more modifications required. Looking at the first drop, you'll notice that the ride's tallest point is now on top of the cliff wall like it was originally designed. Compare this to the psychotic drop the ride opened with in 1992, where the ride was hastily designed to shift itself off the cliff wall at its tallest point. The new drop also begins right at the peak of the lift hill without a small pre-drop and is much steeper than the original, so Iron Rattler's first drop runs right down the side of the cliff wall. This also provides a much larger amount of room for the pullout. Here you can see just how different the first drops are from each other and how much better Iron Rattler's is executed. In fact, Iron Rattler's first drop takes place where the original pre-drop was on Rattler. This is why the first drop zigzags left, and the pullout is basically the zigzag from Rattler's original first drop. Iron Rattler would also introduce a new set of block zones. Compared to the five block zones of before, Iron Rattler would simplify things greatly. Here we have the block zone diagram of Iron Rattler. The new block zones are as follows. The station, the lift hill, and main break one. So essentially, all of the ride from the first drop to the section of brake run immediately before the station all became one block zone. The mid-course block zone was eliminated, as well as the main brake 2 block zone, which now acts solely as a trim brake. This downward sloped brake section is fitted with only magnetic brakes, which are unable to completely stop a train on their own. Thus, the section does not act as a block zone, and the block doesn't end until the section of brake run immediately before the station. With this new setup, Iron Rattler can run a maximum of two trains. Each train on Iron Rattler is designed and manufactured by Gerslauer and features six cars each and seat a total of 24 riders. RMC advertises that Iron Rattler can churn through 850 riders each hour, and I believe this figure is rather accurate. Now 850 riders is a rounded number, as 850 riders divided by 24 riders per train yields 35.4 trains dispatched per hour, which isn't possible. So I'd say the real figure is either 35 trains or 36 trains dispatched per hour, so either 840 or 864 riders per hour. Even if we factor in the higher option, 864 riders per hour, this requires a dispatch from the station every 100 seconds. Iron Rattler is much shorter in duration than the original Rattler, and this interval appears to be no issue with fully loaded trains. Iron Rattler also has a variable speed lift motor, and the train will slowly jog up the lift hill if the main brake 1 block zone is not clear yet. So that will conclude this episode of Problematic Roller Coasters covering the Rattler, a cliff-diving wooden menace of an attraction. The changing demands of Fiesta Texas's founders and the shaded designs from RCCA led to the creation of one of the world's most troubled roller coasters. The ride would injure hundreds of guests, leading to multi-million dollar lawsuits, require major modifications to correct design and build issues, and then somehow become one of the world's best roller coasters. I find the story of Rattler fascinating, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I do. I only wish I were old enough to have experienced the very original version of Rattler in 1992. If you got to ride the original Rattler, comment down below and let me know how it was. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and I hope you learned something new. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and visit our Teespring shop where you can purchase all sorts of Block Zone merch. Also, comment down below which roller coaster you'd like me to cover next in Problematic Roller Coasters. Thanks for watching, everyone.